obviously in the Department of History. And um, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today to the first biennial Sinistet Lecture to be held in the beautiful new Liberal Arts Building Auditorium, which it turns out is not big enough. <laughs> we thought it was. But um, we are happy to have you all here. There are some seats. If, I think we need to have a center aisle for safety purposes, but people can come and sit on the steps if that's more comfortable for you. Um, I'm not saying it's really comfortable, but you know, possibly slightly more. Um, so please feel free to come on down. Um, but I just wanted to start by mentioning that Sig Sinisbet was the chair of the history department here in the 1960s and early 1970s. When he built the department into the strong department that it continues to be today, I was thrilled when I received in the mail yesterday my own copy of his very significant book, The White Response to Black Emancipation, Second Class Citizenship in the U.S. Since Reconstruction. Uh, which was first published in 1972. He was truly a pioneer in the field of African American history and built up the African American Studies program here on campus. That was something that he was very, very committed to and cared about a lot. Um, he, his wife, Nadine Sinistet, was also a dedicated historian and a teacher who shared his anti-racism principles and their mutual love for their five children. Um, we are pleased to honor their legacy through this lecture series, which is named after the two of them. On behalf of the Sinistet family, I have a brief message from Sagan Nadine's daughter, Barbara Sinistet Karas, that I would like to share with you. And what she says, because she's usually here, but they have a reason why they couldn't come. Welcome to this year's Sig and Nadine Sinistet Lecture. While we deeply regret not being able to attend, we are happy to announce the birth of Lachon Cooper, who is uh, born October 8th um, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, second great grandchild for my parents. Um, we will miss the excitement of seeing so many students, teachers, and friends gather here to hear Dr. Francis speak and the educational enlightenment these lectures provide. It is especially gratifying that Dr. Francis is a graduate of the master's program in history here at Brockport. We thank her for her scholarship, and we thank all the good people in the history department who helped organize this event. With warm regards, Barbara Sinisbet Carlos. Uh, and then, you know, turning to the topic, um, sadly, there are still blatant issues of racism everywhere we turn. Educational and legal and political processes are desperately needed to help expose and redress them. Fortunately, we have a guest speaker here with us today who is taking on some of these issues from a historical perspective. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce one of our very own former history graduate students and a dear friend of mine, Dr. Leanne Francis. When she was a graduate student here, she showed remarkable intelligence as well as intellectual and political passion. She wrote her master's thesis as a, a comprehensive examination on socialism, political protest, and the suppression of speech during World War I. We are happy to try to take credit for having noted her talents <laughs> and encouraging her to apply to a PhD program so that she could continue her research and teach at the college level someday. She was accepted at the very prestigious history department at Rutgers University, where she wrote a brilliant dissertation on black women in Auburn, New York, at the turn of the century. And that is partly what she'll be speaking about today. She is currently transforming her dissertation into a book. Dr. Francis already has university presses interested in publishing it. Dr. Francis is now a tenure-track assistant professor at the College of New Jersey, where she is touching the lives of many fortunate students and we were lucky to have her come today and spend the whole day with us here. So many of you have already had a chance to meet her. There is a dessert reception after this event at Professor Stephen Ireland and Susan Ireland's house on Main Street. And uh, any of the history faculty will be able to tell you where that is. And you are all invited, although they probably hope not every single person. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in any case, she does make some really good food. Um, so in any case, um, Dr. Francis is a truly remarkable person, and we are very honored to have her with us as a distinguished citizen memorial lecturer. Thank you. Thank you.
welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Is uh, am I speaking too loudly? Is can everybody hear me? Excellent. Thank you. Before I begin, thank you so much for that generous introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the sponsors of tonight's lecture series, the Sinister family. As a graduate student in Brockport's history department, I attended two of the finest history lectures to which I've been to date. The Sinister lecture series challenged and weighed the critical consciousness of graduate and undergraduate students alike. Thank you, Sinister family. It is a privilege to serve as this year's lecturer, a thrill for a return to my alma mater, and speak before an audience that includes many of my former professors. I would like to thank one of them in particular, Dr. Allison Parker, for her brilliant scholarship and exceptional mentoring. Allison, you exemplify for me all the best attributes that a college professor and historian can possess. You are an inspiration. Finally, thank you Brockport's Department of History for providing me with a solid foundational knowledge of US and world history that empowered me to join academia as your colleague. Today, approximately 10.2 million people are imprisoned worldwide. Now the next, uh, the, qu the question I'm about to ask you, I promised you I wouldn't move, I am moving a little bit in the beginning. Uh, this next question is rhetorical come up with a number in your head. How many of those 10.2 million people do you think are imprisoned in the United States today? The US, the US comprises 5% of the world's population, yet incarcerates roughly 20% of the world's imprisoned people. The United States, the self-proclaimed harbinger, harbinger of freedom and democracy around the world incarcerates more people than any other country on the planet. This is the number of women, men, and children in the U.S. in prisons. 2,217,000 people. The United States has about 320,000 people. Uh, communist China, which has a population far larger than our own, 1.3 billion, 1.3 billion, incarcerates 1.5 million people. The state of California alone imprisons more people than the United Kingdom, France, Germany, and Tajikistan combined. When one accounts for the total number of people under supervision of the U.S. correctional system, When one accounts for the total number of people under supervision of the U.S. correctional system, that is the number of people in local jails, state and federal prisons, on probation and parole, that number exceeds 7 million. Most of them are people of color, mostly African-American, Latino, and Latino, by the way. And in, fa in fact, Michelle Alexander of African Americans under correctional supervision today than, were, than there were uh, African-Americans enslaved in 1850. More African Americans under correctional supervision today than there were enslaved in 1850. The number surpasses 11 million when we include facilities that confine undocumented immigrants, so-called illegal aliens. The U.S. also incarcerates approximately one-third of the world's total population of imprisoned women. That's over half a million. As of the year 2010, about 206,000 women were in local jails, state, and federal prison, prisons. That's just under 10% of the total U.S. prison and jail population. I'm giving you the most recent statistics I can find, by the way. It's not very, not, not very easy to find. Uh, the number of incarcerated women and girls, which tripled, tripled in the last decade, is now increasing almost twice as fast as the men's incarceration rate. Roughly, Roughly 45.5% of women in state or federal prisons at the end of 2008 were white. 
just under 32.6% were African American, and almost 16, almost 16% were Latina. Now, when we compare the percentage of women imprisoned by race to the percentage of women in the total U.S. population by race, here's what we see. White females are about 30% of the total U.S. population. They too were disproportionately incarcerated then because they comprise 45% of, the, uh, of women prisoners. But African-American women, they're 7% of the total U.S. population. 7%, yet 32.6% of the U.S. prison population. Latinas, 8% of the total U.S. population, yet they are 16% of the US, uh, U.S. prison population. The, their incarceration rate then, black and brown women's incarceration rate then, is wildly disproportionate to their numbers in the actual population. Another way to look at it, black women's disproportionate dis uh, incarceration rate, 93 out of every 100,000 white women were incarcerated in 2008, while 349 out of every 100,000 black women and 147 out of every 100,000 Hispanic women were incarcerated. This was 2008. The numbers worse now. It's higher today. African American women are incarcerated disproportionately, so are Latinas. In fact, African American women are incarcerated three times the rate of white women. Currently, black women are the fastest growing prison population. Latinas are incarcerated at almost 1.6 times the rate of white women. Is the microphone? Okay. And the question I'm asking, the question I'm asking you, and I ask with my work is why? How do we explain these race and gender, these race and gender uh, disparities? Why does the U.S.'s criminal, so-called criminal justice system arrest convict and incarcerate African Americans and Latino laws disproportionately. So black women, women of color in general, are disproportionately incarcerated. Would it surprise you? Uh, well, most imprisoned people, 52%, are people of color, most of them black and Latino. Black, black males are the largest in prison racial group at 36% of prisoners. And again, they comprise 6 to 7% of the U.S. population, yet they're 36% of all prisoners in the country. Would it surprise you to know that most black people are in prisons for non-violent drug crimes, most of them marijuana crimes, so roughly 38% of the crimes they commit, uh, rather, 38% of the crimes for which they're convicted are marijuana crimes. Why? When white people are 10 times more likely, 10 times more likely to possess drugs than blacks. Why are blacks 10, 10 times more likely to be convicted of drug offenses? When whites use and deal drugs at the highest rate of all racial groups, specific, specifically crack, cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine, somewhere at seven to 14 times the rate of blacks. Why do black males comprise the largest imprisoned racial group convicted of the use and sale of drugs? Why are black women the fastest growing prison population? And what impact does black women's rapid incarceration rate have on black families, on black communities? Most importantly, how do we stop it? How do we stem this crisis in black women's lives? Today, African American females comprise just 7% of the U.S.'s total population, but they represent almost 33% of the country's incarcerated women. Who are women. That's uh, nationwide. Currently, black women are also the U.S.'s fastest, prison grow, uh, fastest growing prison population, of, as I've said. Black women's high incarceration rate reflects their culmination of a historical trend in their disproportionate arrests, convictions, and imprisonment inside the U.S.'s penal system, which is itself a linchpin of institutional racism, classism, and sexism. It is impossible 
to stop this crisis in African American women's lives without an adequate record of black women prisoners' historical experiences. I discussed the history of upstate New York's black women prisoners in the early 20th century with these caveats in mind. Some of the issues, some of the issues that black women prisoners confronted in the early 1900s are similar, not the same. Historians uh, bristle at anyone who would, uh, or the notion that anyone would draw a, a smooth line between what happened in the distant past and what's happened in the present. So I'm saying some, there are continuities between the past and the present. There are similar issues that incarcerated black women faced in the early 1900s that they face today. In order to situate black women in the U.S.'s history of mass incarceration, in order to explain why they are more likely to come into conflict with the law and more likely to be incarcerated, I developed a conceptual framework to analyze women's crimes. And central to that analytical framework is the concept of criminal work. I use the term criminal work intentionally. Since the 1970s, feminist scholars have revised traditional definitions of prostitution as a crime or sin and have analyzed it instead as a form of sexual labor or sex work. A similar lens can be used to interpret and understand the use of extra legal or illegal means to earn wages or acquire subsistence goods. With this in mind, I've chosen to define black women's criminal activity more generally as a type of labor, that is, as criminal work. I define criminal work as illegal activity, crimes in which people engage in order to acquire subsistence goods, that is the means to feed, clothe, and shelter themselves and their dependents. Criminal work also permits a person to obtain cash or goods that can be sold or exchanged for subsistence goods. The term criminal work refers to a wide range of crimes, crimes such as prostitution, the owning and operating of an illegal business, a business that provides gambling, liquor, commercialized sex, for example. Criminal work also includes theft, I argue, like pickpocketing. Criminal work is routinized or performed regularly. It may serve as a person's sole source of income, or a person may do criminal work in order to supplement wages earned at a legitimate job or legal job. In order to show you what criminal work looks like in the United States, looks like in United States history, I will briefly discuss the following. Auburn State Prison for Women's Prison Population in the early 1900s. Auburn is about three hours, two or three hours from here. I will discuss the landscape of labor in early 20th century New York State, a landscape of work that was crucial to whether black women committed crimes, crucial to whether or not they were economically secure in early 20th century New York. And third, I will discuss discriminatory law enforcement and the racist, sexist beliefs that motivated and justified law enforcement prejudice. Legal practices and prejudices that made it more likely that black females would be arrested and imprisoned than white females in early 20th century New York. In the past and present, in the early 1900s and today, the narratives characterizing the experiences of the U.S.'s women prisoners include a narrative of work, a narrative of discrimination, a narrative of survival. For women imprisoned in the United States, some crimes were a type of work, a consequence of discrimination, and a tool of survival. It was steal or starve, a New York City newspaper headline declared just days after the new year in 1893. The story offered a tacit acknowledgement that some of the women, men and children who committed theft, did so not as the result of an, of an immutable moral defect, a desire to flout authority, or an addiction to the thrill of lawlessness. Instead, some people stole in order to meet their basic life needs. For those people, crime meant survival. Another New York City newspaper quote, quoted a law enforcement official who openly sympathized with a woman accused of stealing. The judge and the press believed that if she was guilty of stealing, 
It was because she sought help. She sought to help her family to endure the wretched poverty in which they lived. The press reported that Mr. Walter Burke, a white man, and the driver of a bread delivery truck, insisted on bringing charges against Mrs. Emma Hodgins, a white woman for allegedly stealing two loaves of bread valued at 10 cents. The judge begged Burke not to press charges against Hodgins, even though the judge did not necessarily believe Hodgins when she said that it was all a misunderstanding. She told the judge that she was in a hurry to feed her two children who had nothing to eat for two days, and her ill husband, who had been out of work for some time. The reporter concluded that she could not resist the temptation to take the bread, but described Hodgins as emphatic in stating that she fully intended to pay for it. Mrs. Hodgins told the arresting officer that she took the bread from the wagon when its driver was making a delivery to the house that adjoined hers. She waited for him on the steps of the building so that she could pay him. I am not a thief, she said. I never stole anything in my life. According to the newspaper, Burke left his truck to watch for the bread thief and pounced, that's the word the reporter used, pounced on Mrs. Hodgins from a neighboring doorway before she had a chance to explain her intention. The journalist implied critique of Burke's action was echoed at Mrs. Hodgins' arraignment where the bread delivery man also failed to win any sympathizers. One reporter described the judge who heard the case as wrathful. The judge declared indignantly in open court that, quote, it will be a long time before I hold a woman for stealing bread, end quote. It's possible the police had never arrested and the magistrate had never arraigned another white woman for stealing bread. The frustration the policeman and the judge expressed may have been entirely absent, or at the very least less pronounced on this occasion had the thief been a woman of color. In the white imagination, black female criminality was primarily, primarily defined as sex crime, particularly prostitution, violent crime, and property crimes, including theft. Popular constructions of black women's criminal behavior drove and justified their disproportionately high arrest and conviction rates, harsher sentencing, lower rates of probation and parole, and inability to access social services or state protective services. Whether a person who committed an alleged crime deserved compassion depended on prevailing moral standards that were fundamentally racialized, gendered, and classed. A similar story involving a woman of color or any person of color would likely have prompted outrage rather than empathy or pity from the mainstream press, police, and judge and, uh, and judges. Offices comprised exclusively of white men, the police being the only exception in the early 1900s. Occasionally, very rarely, a white woman detective was hired temporarily to work on a specific case. In the early 1900s, most white people continued to believe that people of color were biologically inferior, innately defective. Given the ubiquity of this belief, it made sense that most white people also believed that people of color were genetically wired to engage in immoral and criminal behavior. Impoverished white women, at least those who were perceived as good mothers and dutiful wives, were largely immune from the stigmas attached to crime that haunted black women with similar motivations. In the Hodgins case, where a white woman was caught red-handed making away with an item that she had not paid for, the arresting officer apologized to her for taking her into custody. He addressed her as madam, issued respectful requests rather than coarse demands, and chivalrously shielded her from public humiliation by instructing her to, quote, just walk ahead of us, the policeman in Burke, and no one will suspect that you're under arrest, end quote. Significantly, New York County's district attorney's scrapbook of articles from the years 18, 1863 to 1901 did not feature a single article that showed white journalists, police, or judges offering sentimental responses to women of color accused of a similar crime. In fact, there was a stark difference between the character of crimes in which white male journalists focused, on which white male journalists focused when the accused was a black woman and not a white woman. One white reporter described two black females who came into contact with the law, with the law as, quote, bad little black girls. What made black females accused of committing crimes so bad? When black women were cast as the agents of crime in the white press, they were thieves whose crimes frequently were not described in detail. 
Black women were committing acts of violence, sometimes against the white policemen who arrested them. There were reports of black women who murdered their husbands or lovers for refusing to fulfill their promises to marry them after stealing their virtue, essentially after having sex with them, making them unfit to marry, using them as they would a prostitute. Some women murdered husbands or lovers who had affairs with other women or abandoned them for other women. The white press depicted accused black women then as either malicious crooks, irrationally violent, or murderous psychopaths. Did white reporters talk about bad little white girls? Generally speaking, no, they did not. Not in a way that highlighted or spotlighted white women's racial identities in relationship to their crimes. White women accused of crimes appeared in the white press as petty thieves who stole to support their dependents, but also brothel madams who maintained their feminine respectability. Prostitutes or white slaves forced into prostitution. Murderers, typically of husbands or lovers that physically abuse them. Bigamists, midwives who perform abortions that kill the, women have, the woman having the abortion. White women were represented committing a broader range of crimes, often because they were compelled to do so by economic forces or real hardened criminals or a physically abusive spouse. Accused white women could often count on the sympathy of the press, the jury, and the court. White females who came into conflict with the law might be portrayed as white girls that did bad things, but they were not bad little white girls. They were not defined and demarcated as essentially or fundamentally bad. In contrast, black females did bad things because they were inherently immoral. According to whites, black females were not forced into crime by poverty or a violent husband. Their evil was inborn. Genetics, not circumstance, made them bad. Black women accused of crimes then were often tried and convicted multiple times, first by the white policemen that suspected and later arrested them, then in the press, and finally in the courts. White men's chivalry was not a benefit that was accessible to the vast majority of black women because most late 19th century whites did not view black women as ladies. Ladyhood was a white woman's entitlement and one and one that was largely the province of middle and upper class members of the race. The ladyhood archetype the ladyhood ideal evolved out of the 19th century Victorian ideology of true womanhood, which defined ladies as morally pure, non-sexual, dutiful wives and mothers who did not do heavy, dirty labor with their hands and who confined their work to the domestic or private sphere. A life bereft of public toil or wage work, one where a woman did not do the cumbersome, filthy work of hired servants, was the life of an economically elite woman. Since all black women, regardless of class status, were perceived as sexually promiscuous Jezebels, the Victorian true woman ideal applies solely to white male and upper class women. Since women who committed crimes, women who worked in illegal businesses, for example, were often entrepreneurial and navigated the public sphere, were lawbreakers, and in the case of prostitutes, were engaging in non-procreative, unnatural sex, they were the true woman's moral and behavioral antithesis her opposite. Nonetheless, African American women across class lines defined themselves as ladies, even as they debated the meaning of the term. Sometimes black women invoked these debates in the US's exclusively white male dominated legal context. Poor black women who kept a clean house, raised their children to be polite, attended church regularly, women who viewed their dress, speech, and carriage as a mark of dignity, might claim ladyhood status in their community. But could black women who engaged in criminal activity, black women who stole, for example, to support themselves or their family make such claims, even among African Americans? Some blacks must have believed black women who committed theft deserved a chance to make their case. While it is true that some African American women and men found a respite from Southern violence and the chance to make a decent living in the North, many others discovered that it was impossible to survive in their new home without resorting to activities considered illegal by the larger society. Given the extreme poverty and white racism enmeshed in the intersecting oppressions that contextualized and inspired the crimes black females committed, and most blacks in the early, early 1900s lived 
in poverty, many of them in extreme poverty. It is unsurprising that if African American women were sentenced for stealing significantly smaller amounts than white women. White newspapers across the country supply examples of these small-scale thefts, for which most of New York State's and the nation's black women were arrested, convicted, and imprisoned. On Sunday, January 1901, a white reporter for Virginia's Richmond Dispatch issued a two-sentence statement on a local woman's theft of food. Mary Bland, quote, Mary Bland, a colored woman, was charged with stealing a cabbage from a store on Hull Street, end quote. The mayor and judge fined Miss Bland $5 for her crime, which she deeply regretted. Other than noting that Bland's crime and remorse made the court very interesting for the adjudicator, the journalist supplies no other information about the case. Did Mary Bland have anything in common with that Emma Hodgins beyond the theft of food worth less than a dollar? Did Bland steal food because she could not afford to pay for it and needed to feed herself and her children? Or is Bland nothing more than a petty criminal who stole because she was indifferent to or contemptuous towards society's laws? How would Bland respond to the reporter's observation that she was apologetic? Why was she sorry she stole the cabbage? The fact that most black females in the South lived in grinding poverty and survived on the low wages from exhausting domestic work and the help of family and friends suggests that it was less likely that Mary Bland stole cabbage due to an immoral hostility toward the law or a misdirected quest for adventure. It is more likely that an economic and moral imperative to sustain herself her children through poverty motivated Bland's crime. As Cheryl Hicks notes in, their, in his responses to Mary Bland's and Emma Hodges' arrest indicates, quote, making unfortunate choices did not always result in incarceration, but when it did, black women were more vulnerable than white women to being seen as criminal, end quote. Many white Americans in the late 19th century interpreted crime as a manifestation of the Negro problem, and the media responded with outrage at what they considered an assault on racial white, on white racial privilege. Some civic leaders directed their anger at the rising tide of European immigration and black migration, others on inadequate law enforcement, and a few focused on deeper social problems such as poverty. Theft, a form of criminal work, was one symptom of poverty. All those statistics for this kind of criminal work are nearly impossible to find. It seems likely that the majority of these workers made enough to survive, but little more. And even though many were aware that the punishment if caught could be severe, criminal workers often did what they did because their backs were slammed hard against an immovable wall of limited or no economic choices. It was steal or starve, criminal worker homelessness, illegal ventures, or death. For women especially, criminal work in the late 19th century meant bare survival for those with little or no options left. In the South, white policemen had no problem arresting black women, men, and children for committing survival crimes or poverty crimes, such as the theft of small amounts of food to sustain themselves and their families through wrenching poverty, hunger, and sickness. Post-Civil War South pig laws, for instance, permitted judges to strip black men of the vote and sentenced them along with black women and children who defied the law to prison camps where black boys as young as six were forced to perform hard manual labor alongside adult black men in deadly conditions for private white male businessmen. While pig laws did not exist in the North, state authorities, police, judges, and juries used laws against theft and non-rehabilitative custodial prisons to penalize and persecute black people disproportionately. The, criminal, the criminalization of survival crimes rooted in poverty hit African Americans, including women, particularly hard. In general, black female offenders were desperate for stability in housing, employment, and wages. They were women in crisis, women whose problems were typical among black women in their communities. Their crimes often reveal conditions, motivations, and themes distinct from those of white female, white male, and black male offenders. For these black women, crime was a mechanism of survival and even a kind of work. Crime was a rational, pragmatic, and for many women, perfectly moral response to constrained or absent choices and limited or inaccessible resources. I will now look at the business of stealing black women's criminal work. So stealing could be thought of as Miss Lulu Thompson's second job. 
She was legally employed as a domestic for a white family in New York County and illegally self-employed as a thief. Ms. Thompson's legitimate job as a household servant provided an important context for her criminal work. When the press described her as, quote, a colored lady of the duskiest hue, end quote, they appeared to be evaluating not only the complexion of her skin, but the complexion of her soul. At least once, Thompson stole from her employer to demonstrate her affections for a particular gentleman, a black Adonis, or so the white press believed. The reporter temporarily set aside his sarcasm when he wrote that Thompson was, quote, alleged to be an old offender of this domestic game of affecting a foothold in a house and then taking the first opportunity to depart for unknown latitudes with whatever of value might be in sight, end quote. Ms. Thompson was charged with having stolen $1,000 worth of jewelry and a comparable amount in cash from the home of Jerome M. Sherry at Long Branch, New York, between mid-May and July 19th, the term of her employment there. The press, far more amused at the situation than Ms. Thompson said that the dusky damsel left the ocean-swept shores of Long Branch with an escort of policemen who had been seeking the pleasure of her company. Unlike the officer who, officers who arrested Mrs. Emma Hodgins, a white woman for stealing bread, Ms. Lulu Thompson's escort of policemen did not offer to shield her from public shame by inviting her to walk ahead of them so it would not appear that she was in their custody. In court, Thompson stated that she had pawned a pair of $400 earrings, $50 of which she had sent to her mother who needed the money, and the rest she had spent on herself. She had given the jewelry she had not pawned to her man, John Johnson, whose whereabouts were unknown. Thompson's household work and criminal work permitted her to financially support her mother and perhaps her romantic partner, who may have been jobless or among the working poor. Neither the papers, nor the police, nor the judge, who was, interest, was interested in the motives of the Thompson's crime. In fact, the press was so disinterested in her case that they entirely abandoned the telling of Thompson's story after just one article, which was not the case with Hodgins, whose story received repeated media attention for days after she was arrested for stealing bread, even after the police court judge dismissed the charges against her. When Emma Hodgins was arrested for stealing, the press, the police, and the judge were extremely concerned about the reasons she committed a crime. These white male authorities cared that Hodges, her two children, and her sick husband had not eaten for two days. They had a great deal of empathy for her as a poor mother and wife who was only trying to feed her family. Perhaps Lulu Thompson had a sick or unemployed elderly mother who lived by herself in the South. Thompson said that her mother needed the money. Since most late 19th century African Americans lived in wrenching poverty, it is possible that her mother would not eat had Thompson not provided her with cash. Without further testimony from Thompson, it is impossible to know how few or how many factors, either serious or benign, motivated her decision to become a criminal thief. It is clear that white journalists, policemen, and the judge did not care to know. Their sympathy was inaccessible to Lulu Thompson. Their empathy was reserved for white women like Emma Hodges. The fact that New York City's White, white papers failed to report the small-scale theft crimes for which most of the states and nations, black women were arrested, convicted, and imprisoned had serious consequences for black females. The overrepresentation of black women's more serious property crimes, such as Lulu Thompson's burglary, and the invisibility of less severe offenses that typified black women's crimes, such as Mary Bland's cabbage theft, fueled flawed stereotypes of black female criminals. White media discourse often muted the victimization of black women within the justice system and in larger society. In addition, one black woman's criminal behavior was often projected onto the entire race, while the crimes of white women were taken as indicators of individual moral failings and not of deficits afflicting the white race en masse. White journalists' portrayal, white journalists portrayal of black female criminality thus reflected appeal to and exploit the dominant society's racist, sexist ideologies. Contrary to the images that prevailed in mainstream media, public opinion and social scientific discourses, black women who committed theft were very much like the impoverished white women with whom white reporters and officials sympathized. In her statement to the parole board, for example, a black woman in prison in Auburn revealed that her arrest for theft occurred when her husband was sick and out of work. 
Like Emma Hodgins, this black woman committed theft in response to economic hardship, as well as her spouse's illness and joblessness. But Hodgins received empathy from white officials and reporters and ultimately gained her freedom. The black woman received a grand larceny conviction and a prison sentence. Details about the minor property crimes committed by most black women, much less information on discriminatory sentencing, did not appear in New York City papers. Instead, they documented black women's crimes only when the offenses were serious and or violent and unlikely to elicit public sympathy and frequently when the victims were white. Furthermore, the most serious crimes tended to receive more extensive coverage in the white press, especially when they involved violence, whereas low-level thefts were the subject of terse reports were entirely ignored. White media exaggerated the scale, severity, and frequency of black women's crimes. In so doing, white journalists radically distorted the reality and the public's perception of black women and their criminal offenses. The majority of black females who committed crimes in New York were employed women responding to poverty, mainly through small-scale small theft, and their criminal activity was largely interracial. They tended to commit crimes in black communities, and their crimes were largely nonviolent. Yet the white press both constructed and reinforced the dominant society's myth of the black female offender whose preferred victim was white and whose brutality rivaled that of any male criminal. The black female offender was thus clearly distinguished from her white counterpart, counterpart as uniquely depraved. Exactly why did the business of stealing appeal to so many of Auburn's women prisoners? The prison registers show that between 1893 and 1900, most women inmates were poor household workers who had been convicted of theft, which was one type of criminalized work and an important source of income for most imprisoned women. This was true for incarcerated women across race lines. Most African-American, European immigrant, and US-born white women prisoners had been household workers, domestic workers, who were convicted of theft. African-American women, however, were overrepresented in the prison population, overrepresented among the poor, and overrepresented among women in jail for theft. The vast majority of black women convicts also identified low-wage domestic work as their occupation and migrated to New York from the South. So as I stated earlier, prison registers show that in upstate New York, African American women were overrepresented in the prison population, overrepresented among the poor, overrepresented among low wage workers, and overrepresented among women in jail for theft. While a large number of the, of the native born white women imprisoned at Auburn had also been jailed for theft, were likely to be poor, and did low wage work, white women in fact were underrepresented in these categories. Again, in contrast to black women who were overrepresented. These facts bring us back to the place we began, the question of why. Why were women prisoners disproportionately African-American, disproportionately poor, disproportionately low-wage workers? Why? There are many dis answers to this question. I discussed two. First, the landscape of labor in early 20th century New York, which was racialized, gendered, and classed. A landscape of labor that constrained or entirely eliminated black women's legal, well-paying job choices. Second, dis the disparate or unequal legal treatment of black and white women accused of crimes, illustrated by the case studies of Emma Hodgins and Lulu Thompson, and the differential response of reporters, police, and judges to their crimes. Thus, in seeking to explain women's imprisonment rates, these two factors, work and law officials' discrimination, are fundamentally interconnected. In conclusion, the criminal activity of women like Lulu Thompson demonstrate that black women and criminal workers lay at the intersection of early, 19th, 20th, early, 19th, early 20th century narratives of worker survival. Although an unsympathetic press did not portray women like Thompson as women who committed survival crimes, Thompson's status as a low wage worker suggests that criminal work either supplemented legal work or criminal work sole, served as the sole means of obtaining the goods or cash to help them elude the grasp of abject poverty in New York. Only Lulu Thompson knows the true motives for her crimes. As a historian, I can tell you that Thompson was a worker in a multiracial, informal, or illegal economy. And at Auburn State Prison, Thompson was representative, re representative of the women in prison there, women workers and women survivors. 
So what do early 20th century imprisoned black women's experiences suggest about the forces contributing to black women's disproportionate incarceration rate in 2015? In the early 2000s, some black women participate in an illegal economy, some of them as criminal workers. Most incarcerated black women have been convicted today of small-scale theft and low-level nonviolent drug offenses, mostly marijuana crimes. Some of these women are involved in the drug trade as small-scale drug dealers or as assistants to drug dealers. What if we thought of women drug dealers as business people, as entrepreneurs in an, in an illegal economy? What if we thought of the women that work for drug dealers as workers in a criminalized trade? What does the poverty rate of black women involved in illegal economies tell us? Most imprisoned women are poor. Again, a large number of imprisoned women are involved in the illegal drug trade. How is their poverty linked to the crimes they commit? How is poverty linked to women's criminal work? How does poverty influence a black woman's decision to deal drugs or work for a drug dealer? What does the public tend to assume about poor black women? What do law enforcement officials think about poor black women? What is the race and class of the woman that tends to fall under suspicion of committing a crime? The black woman who deals drugs, is she a criminal or is she a worker? Is she a bad girl or is she a woman that is surviving? These are the kinds of questions historical evidence can help us answer. The evidence, these living, breathing histories, holding places for old, urgent hopes, failed dreams, and desperate creative efforts to survive, is ours to discover, ours to interpret, ours to understand. Please allow me to make one final comment. The continuities in U.S. crime and prison history should lead us to indict today's system of mass incarceration as fundamentally racist, fundamentally sexist, fundamentally classist. What else can we conclude when black and brown communities are literally policed, arrested, and convicted for crimes more often committed in white communities? Drug crimes. Whiteness is a license to use and deal drugs free from comparative public and law enforcement scrutiny. Today's bad neighborhoods, the racialized condemnation of these neighborhoods, they're stereotyped, stereotyped as havens for welfare queens, crack mothers who give birth to crack babies, who grow into thugs, that terrorize their own communities and terrorize whites. Isn't that the widespread belief? Even though most crime is intraracial, white people mostly, or most of the people committing crimes against white people are white, most of the people committing crimes against black people are black, and so on. Whites are more likely, much more likely, four times actually, four times more likely to be assaulted by another white person than they are a black person. These beliefs justify police killings of unarmed innocents. These, these beliefs justify beatings, police beatings and executions of black and brown people whose crimes do not warrant unofficial and an, un, an unofficial death sentence. Ours is the era activists and scholars call the new Jim Crow where people living under police occupation, literally living under police occupation, and with the stigmatization of white mainstream media, must declare what should be obvious, that black lives matter. When black lives matter, truly matter to a critical mass of white people, white folks will come together to force the kind of institutional changes that will stop racist police profiling, stop racist arrests, stop racist incarceration rates, and our prison population will decrease. Thank you. Katrina experience was, oh my gosh, 
look at all those poor black people who are stealing and looting stores. Versus, oh my gosh, look at those. My goodness, she she's she's a nice white mother and she she needed to get shoes for her children, so she borrowed some from a store. I mean I exaggerate. Or found, literally the found. language. Found. Um, so we've been talking about this this discourse, this discussion, this dialogue that posits looting is a crime, taking when you need it is not, and that's totally racialized. Found it. <laughs> I, I, mean, I think you said it, I think you've heard enough from me, but you, you said it perfectly well. Black people loot, white people borrow. Black people loot, white people find. Black people are just dangerous and criminal and immoral and irrational and must steal all the time. And white people, they're making good choices for themselves and their families. What else can they do? Um, I will link it, actually. I will link the Hurricane Katrina discourse to the discor discourse on Ferguson, the, the more recent, uh, even more recent Ferguson protests, which I found that dis discourse profoundly disturbing. If you read or listened to uh, white mainstream media, you would, you would believe that everybody in that community, or at least most of them, were just rioting. They were just pouring through the streets, right, uh, over this death of, a, of this, this, we're supposed to believe this, this, this guy is a, this is just horrible criminal, because we're, we're also supposed to believe that he stole some cigars or some cigarettes, for which, it may, for, for which we should accept that he was executed in the street. Because if he was behaving, he wasn't behaving so badly then his life wouldn't have been in danger. And uh, what about the part where he ran toward a hail of bullets? That demon, 18-year-old black boy, ran towards a hail of bullets. And we're all supposed to go, yeah, okay, that sounds perfectly reasonable. Had to kill him. When it's true that the majority of people protesting in Ferguson are perfectly nonviolent, it's true that the people who were looting, is always the word used, weren't from the community, and the, and this, out of the six buildings that burned one night, one was the church of the, of the murdered boy's father. It's to, when you see the images, you don't see, there was, a, there, was a, there was a picture of a black male throwing a, what the press called a Molotov cocktail, a homemade pop, throwing it, you know, and really it was a tear gas canister that the police had thrown into this peacefully protest, this crowd of peaceful protest, and the guy was throwing it back. But, what, if you, but really, if you go back and you look at these images on CNN, you see black guys on top of cars, stomping in hoodies and all that, the, the menacing, it's like, and, and you know, I almost, it's like, what else are people, especially white people, supposed to believe when that's the image that you're given? But, I'm, but, I, but I am asking, you're asking, I'm asking us the question, is this really what's happening? Is this, is this really what's happening? Why is it that, last thing I'm gonna, why is it that after a football game or a hockey game or whatever it is, white guys that turn cars over and climb things and burn things are just having fun? Why is that just people having fun? And black people that are protesting the routine murders of unarmed innocents or people that commit small scale crime, and why is that a riot? And the other thing is just people having fun. Um, you know, we should ask that question. Uh, does anybody? You had a question. Yes, sir. Um, Michelle Alexander, in her book on the New Jim Crow, um, very compellingly correlated the high rates of black incarceration today to the deliberate choice of the criminal justice system in the United States. It's effectively target on white people by constructing the law in such a way that although it's neutral on its face, it would pretty much guarantee that the law was enforced more heavily on urban black populations. And so the question I have is, do you see anything like that occurring in the late 19th, early 20th century with respect to the black populations that end up um, being disproportionately yes. in prison? Yes, I do. Oh, great question. Actually, I don't need the microphone. I do? I need it. It's good. OK. <laughs> are in prison for theft. Uh, what I see is that 
the, the largest group of imprisoned black women are imprisoned for various forms of theft, robbery, robbery, uh, burglary, gr burglary, grand, grand larceny. A lot of the white women got fraud, forgery. I'm sorry, forgery, forging bad checks. Um, so I'm saying that, I mean, here's a, here's a case. There's one woman, Bertha Laws. This woman must have just been some kind of white woman fairy magician that could cast a spell on any white man. And she, 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 she convinced this diplomat that she was his daughter. Built him out of 30, to, somewhere between 30 and 60,000 dollars. That's a huge gap. 30 to 60,000 dollars. Early, 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 early. It's a lot of money today. She got two years. Amelia Dunbar, a black woman, so a, a, a clothing knife worth a thousand dollars. She also got two years, and she died in prison. She got two years in the mother. She died in So the laws um, were always applied more harshly. Oh, sorry. Most of the time they were applied more harshly. Um, it was a different type of laws. So, but but technically, that was then no, no. The, uh, the drug crimes are uh, drug offenses were um, in, among the women's population. Pretty rare for a person to be convicted of a drug offense. It was, it was mostly theft. Um, uh, mostly theft. We yeah, have mostly theft. There's maybe some abortions, some prost prostitution. You know, but always a high one. Uh, Who would like to? Um, I have a question that um, in a recent I see a lot of, about the releasing of almost 6,000 inmates who are charged with drug crimes. And I wanted to know, do you think that is an initiative to um, reduce how many people who are incarcerated, or is it solely really to um, start stop charging people who use petty drug crimes? I'll tell you what the incentive <laughs> Taxpayers are paying $59 billion a year. We're paying $59 billion a year to lock people up to smoke weed. <laughs> How many of you, don't raise your hand. <laughs> How many of you, white folks especially, smoke weed? How many of you drank underage? How many of you have black mommies and daddies that actually grow the weed in your basement? Something I would never attempt because I'm black. <laughs> but yet, hundreds of thousands of people are being locked up for smoking weed, or having a drug addiction, or selling just selling a little bit of crack. So you can buy the backwards buy some more drugs, let's be honest. <laughs> so, um, the decarceration is it's really pragmatic, it's really logical. There are, there are taxpayers that are like, this is costing way too much money. You gotta stop locking people up for having a drug problem. You can stop them like that. Um, but also, lawmakers and politicians, the people that run the system, are starting to see that. There, 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 there are prisons that are just losing a lot of money. Um, there is a push uh, in, in Congress uh, to, to decarcerate. There's literally a push. I don't worry, I'm like, so, so even, I want to say too many. Even though, Crime has suddenly been on the decline from the 1970s. Incarceration rates just skyrocketed, especially under Clinton, President Clinton, the Democrat, our first black president, locked up a whole lot of black people. <laughs> a whole lot of them. Um, so there are, people, there, there, there are people that are in control of, of, these, of the legal system and of, of the government that are recognizing that, that, that this is not that even on the South the drug war. The drug war has lost. Wait, what? It just cost one trillion dollars to allow the people to smoke weed because they're not getting people who are doing all the big trafficking. Okay, in Latin America, they're not getting though. They're getting the little drug. Anyway, doesn't matter. Okay. So, so, I'm not answering you. The people that are recognizing and they're 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 decarcerating. Good. But once people are out now, I mean, there's so many things. You, you, you if you have a felony drug conviction. 
you, you, you're not voting for a period of years. In two states, you're not voting again ever. You're going to you go into the system before you rack up all these court fees and court costs and custody, your, your child custody, and you, you leave poor, you can't access public housing. Do you know that white, a white man with a criminal record, a white man with a criminal record is slightly more likely to get a job than a black man without one? So, um, I, I over answered your question. I do that all the time. You like to I was wondering what you think about uh, decriminalizing uh, marijuana and other drugs. I agree with you. But in terms of economics and the criminal labor that is in a lot of ways contributing to a lot of black families. But it's illegal. <laughs> if you legalize it, it will it's it not stay, locking them up anymore. Will, will it stay in black people's hands? hands. You're, okay, yes, they're pro yes, this is capitalism we're talking about. <laughs> All right? You know, yes, there are going to be some really smart white people out there like, who makes money out of this? All right? Um, but at least, at least right now, if if if, if marijuana and this isn't decriminalized in some parts, up to a certain amount in certain parts of the country, you criminalize it and then you don't have so many people. Period. Because when white people lock up, they're they're mostly poor, right? Um, you don't have so many people getting locked up in these drug crimes. And you know, so you decriminalize marijuana, you treat people's drug addictions, you create jobs that are legal. They offer people job training, right? Improve, there's, so, there's so many things. Improve the schools that poor people across race lines have access to. You may you create other, uh, you change the institutions linked to the prison system uh, in order to, to just stop this madness. You have a question? Um, so, your entire talk has sort of been based around that a lot of the crimes that are committed on, across all races is survival. And one of the things that I've seen in recent times is, is the argument that jail is almost better than the streets and that you get three knots in a cop, possible college education, vocational training. Do you see any validity to the argument as far as survival that it might be better to be in jail than to be out on the street? No. <laughs> I think the people that say that have never been to, oh yes, of course, I, I didn't even, I don't know uh, Yes, it's a good question. There are people that think that, and I think the people that ask that have never been to prison. Prison is an awful place to be, even if there is a TV. For one reason, with among women, the majority of women that are in prison are, are survivors of rape and some kind of partner abuse. So you have rape victims who are entering sex work and, and using drugs, for example, in part because they're rape victims. They go to prison and they're very likely to be raped again there, not by the inmates, but by the guards. So what I'm saying is, no matter what, I know they have these shows, locked down, and, uh, and like they have these shows, and you're like, oh, that looks so bad. It's bad. Prison's bad. Read about it. It's bad. So, and also, President Clinton made sure that most prisoners would not have access to an education inside. He made sure of that. Most prisoners will not even get a GED class. And there are prisons, at least in Jersey, I lived there for many, many years, where I, I taught in a program, taught where you get college credit. We, you know, the, that program was eliminated, funding was cut. But it's a great, I think it's a great idea. Now people get pissed off about that. So you get to commit a crime, you go to college for free. I can't get to commit a crime. They got to pay for college. So your kids probably smoke weed in college. <laughs> probably smoke weed and drink it illegally at college, right? But okay, your kid's perfect and studies all the time. Doesn't do anything like that. So, um, you know, here's what I'm saying. Your question was a good one. I hope I answered it. I'm suggesting there's a problem with the way that we speak about people who break the law. Because all of us have broken the law in some way, even if it's a traffic law, right? There's a problem with the way that we think about people who break the law. They're treated like, and thought of as though, they're, as they're completely undeserving of anything. Um, and that kind of thinking is not serving us. Because here's the last thing I'm going to say. If prisons were a cure for crime, there wouldn't be any. 
It's not a cure for crime. Most people, they go to prison, leave, and commit more crimes. Okay? It's more like crime training. Lock up criminals and a bunch of other criminals. Like, how are you gonna get a PhD in crime? And somebody? Can I ask you a question? This is my opinion. Two more questions now. Oh. I heard. Outside your time, you are very warm and many people say. I will raise my question after my personal experience on radio in 1963. The news stated that a black man was driving a Mercedes in New York City. In New York State. Police chased him, pulled him out, and beat him up. And he constantly yelled at them, I am a Jerian, I'm not a Negro, I'm a Jerian. They, they apologized for him and they died. And I was asking myself, who killed the matter? White were the capitalists, blacks were the workers, free workers. So in real terms, blacks really built America. That's my view. But at the same time, now Asiatics made 20 million people of this country. Today are Asiatics. And the estimates are by the year 2050, there will be 38% of the US population. Your study focused on a comparative look on Hispanics, Blacks, and Whites. I wish by chance or by design you included Asiatics because their incarceration rate is very, 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 very poor. Uh, I was reading in news just a few days ago that we have brought in Bhutanese. If you don't know where Bhutan is, a tiny little country on the east side of Bhutan. And they have been given one month to three months to learn English and get into the job market. And they are given one of their own who was already here for three, four, five years to leave them. And they are now very well adjusted in the US. You see job market as well as in our society. I would think that it would be very useful to take a cue from Asiatic people who come here, don't speak English, learn English, they have no father, no mother, no grandfather, no uncle, no uncle, start a new life and have a head start. Uh, your so first, first, it also, you didn't, you didn't say it this way, you were very respectful, but it bothers me that my study is basically black and white. The reason it's that way, so talking about first, first of my research, is that so few, in, in the New York City area, that's really where the majority of the prison population is coming from in the time period that I cover, there were so few people, uh, Asian immigrants and Asian Americans, so few, I mean, I, I, could go, I could look for decades and see one person that was identified as Chinese, one person that was identified as Syrian, one person that was identified as Cuban and Puerto Rican. There's so few, there's no, uh, there's no community. I don't know how I'm going to fix it yet. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, that's thought, I'm having thoughts about it all the time. So thank you for that. So yes, there's an omission in my study. Part of it is the sources. As for this conversation, um, I went 43 minutes and I was thinking that people were ready to just get up. And, so uh, part of it was just getting the talk done. But I can tell you that even though uh, and you didn't say this, but even though Asians, Asian immigrants and Asian Americans are held up in this country as the model minority, like blacks should look at them and, and, and learn and just get right. Asians are good, why? You know, Asians, right? Disproportionately, actually, the highest rate of welfare use is uh, Southeast Asians. Southeast Asians have the highest rate of, of, of welfare use. Um, there are reasons that, that, aid, that, that Asian immigrants and Asian Americans, Asian immigrants actually, don't do too much, too much. Let me put it simply. I'm saying that if we were in the Southwest, if we were in California, there would be vast, vast numbers of Asian communities struggling with poverty and facing the very same problems that blacks and Latinos are facing with the hyper-criminalization, the hyper-police surveillance of their neighborhoods. They too are disproportionately incarcerated. You're right, it wasn't in my study, but that's what, when I refer to people of color, I was using that as a shorthand for blacks, Latinos, and the various Asian groups. Anybody that doesn't check the non-white box on the paper, whatever problem you have with the boxes. 
Uh, so Asians actually are struck, even though there's a, a percentage of Asians that are doing well, there are many, many, many Asians that are also struggling to disproportionately with poverty and with prison issues. Does that answer you? Okay. One more you said? And please, if you'd like to speak afterwards, if any kind of comments or feedback, I'd love to hear it. It's hard, but you really want me to do this? What? Oh, one for one? Yeah. Okay, yeah, you go have the dessert. You pick. <laughs> you are all invited. I, I, so it's, it's a smaller group now, they can definitely fit there. I think I'll hear your question afterwards. Why? <laughs> I'd love to hear it afterwards. So across the hall from me, um, there's a gentleman who lives there who has been convicted of two felonies, not drug related, and his girlfriend is incarcerated for taking the fall because of the defendant. His third, and obviously that means a lot of time they have to look at. Um, obviously, we probably hard to find data on this. Um, I know personally of at least one other case, um, but do you have an opinion, or have you seen that even that is increasing, where maybe the woman didn't even necessarily commit the crime, but is attempting to have some sort of family semblance by taking them all. Oh, oh yes. Those, Those are some of the worst stories uh, that uh, if most cases, almost all of them, don't go to court, they're pleat, they're pled out, and people are encouraged to report other people. So, in a case, for example, where a girlfriend picked up the phone and gave it to her boyfriend who was doing the drug deal, that boyfriend rolled it, that ro boyfriend stitches on the girlfriend. True story, she goes to jail for 20, she gets a 27 year conviction, okay? Uh, loses her children, I mean, so that happens a lot to women. That happens a lot. It's very easy for people connected to that woman or not connected to that woman to just, because that's how you get a shorter prison term. And many, many, many people uh, take that option. Can I just take one more? No, no, we're done. Okay, we're so done. Uh, this is a comment or a question. Thank you so much for staying.